as Jeremy said, I was the co coordinator of the Oz Immune Study, which was um, a multi-centre study. That means it was in four centres, so Brisbane, Newcastle, Geelong and Tasmania, the whole island of Tasmania. Um, it was a case control study, so we had people who had had their very first diagnosis of central nervous system demyelination. So they didn't have a diagnosis of MS. We wanted to get people really early in their disease process because the questions we were asking them about were exposures to environmental factors. Our work's not so much about cure, but more about prevention. On the other hand, prevention might be able to tell us some, give us some clues to um, cure. So we wanted to get these people right at the very beginning of their disease before they might have changed their behaviour. So you can imagine with sun exposure, we wanted to find out from people how much sun exposure they had and whether our case group, the people with first demyelinating events, were any different from our control group. If we waited until they actually had MS, then they might have changed their behaviour and they were different, but that was different because they had MS, not, not the other, the sun exposure was low sun exposure was causing the MS. So that study went on from, um, we recruited people from 2004 to the end of 2006, and we had ended up with 282 people across the four centres who'd had our first diagnosis of um, central nervous system demyelination, horrible words they have, um, and 558 people randomly selected from the Australian electoral roll um, who were the same age and sex as a, a case, so each person had two or three controls matched to them. Um, and we have an enormous amount of data. Those people have been followed also for two to three years in the first instance, and now we've got the Oslong study, which was funded by NH and MRC, following those people out to five years from the first time they participated in the Ozimune study. And we're particularly interested there about environmental factors that influence people who have a first myelinating event, who goes on to have MS and who doesn't, because some people won't. So our exciting... If we think about, we're mainly interested in environmental effects on immune fun on developing MS, but we're also we have a lot of genetic data um, and we have a lot of blood stored. So there are a lot of lot of things that we can explore beyond environmental effects. So the the three really, the environmental influences on MS that are where there's really strong evidence and where there's consistent evidence. There's there's lots of things that people bring up, but they haven't, haven't been confirmed in other studies, are smoking, vitamin D or sun exposure, and Epstein-Barr virus. Those are the things. So I'll just quickly deal with the, the smoking. Um, so lots of people have shown a dose-response effect in smoking. So the more you smoke and the longer you smoke for, the higher your risk. They've shown that that risk persists up until about five years after you stop smoking. We haven't looked in detail at our smoking data. That's the next cab off the rank for us. So it's a watch this space. The work that um, Jeremy referred to, I'm sure people have heard about latitudinal gradients of multiple sclerosis. Liz mentioned them. We also found that um, these first myelinating events was much more common in Tasmania than Brisbane and really along a latitude gradient, so a really a pretty nice straight line. Um, for incidents of those events. And then we started to look at... So we started to investigate why that latitude gradient was there. And, of course, one of the things that lots of research has been done is on vitamin D and on sun exposure. And people in the past have shown that higher vitamin D levels decrease your risk of getting multiple sclerosis or flip it the other way around. So low vitamin D levels increase your risk. What we found in our study, we found the same thing. There was a, a modest vitamin D effect. Um, you People with lower vitamin D certainly did have a higher risk of being a case in the study, so of having central nervous system demyelination. But the other thing we found that nobody had ever shown before was that even if you took vitamin D out of the equation, sun exposure itself was also important. So lots of studies, have, several studies have shown in the past that sun exposure, higher levels of sun exposure decrease the risk of MS, but they've never had, they've, 
studies have either had sun exposure or they've had vitamin D. They haven't had both. So people have just said with the sun exposure, oh, that's a vitamin D effect, and they've just assumed it's a vitamin D effect. But of the sun rays that hit Earth, the vitamin D effective rays make up only a tiny amount of that UV, ultraviolet radiation that hits Earth. So our study showed for the first time that, that sun exposure itself had an effect that wasn't a vitamin D effect, there was something else happening there. More work's required, obviously, to work that out. But what it does mean is that as we go forward thinking about vitamin D prevention trials, we also have to take account of how much sun exposure people are having. And now Jeremy doesn't know about this, but I'll talk very briefly about Epstein-Barr virus because we have a publication coming out in July in neurology that you don't know about yet. Um, so again, lots of studies have shown that um, people with MS report a past history of glandular fever more often. Obviously, everybody who has glandular fever doesn't go on to get MS, but if you have MS, a lot, of, a lot more people have had glandular fever than people who haven't had MS. If you look at the, the virus that causes glandular fever is Epstein-Barr virus, and you can look at the antibody levels that, that people have, and 99 to 100% of people with multiple sclerosis have got antibodies to Epstein-Barr virus, which means that they have been in contact with it at some time in their past. In the normal population, most of the rest of us have also been in contact with it, so 95, 96%, but there is that difference. What we've done in with the samples from the Oz immune study is that um, we could only afford to look at half the sample, unfortunately, so our numbers are, are a little low. But we've actually looked at the Epstein virus, is a very nifty virus. It actually um, inserts itself into the B lymphocyte. So you've heard about T cells before, these are B cells, and it stays there and it immortalizes those B cells so that they live forever. They don't sort of die and get destroyed. So each of us that has been in contact with Epstein Barr virus, we've got a little bit of this virus, very small amounts, and they just circulate around with our B cells. And when those B cells split and make new B cells, um, it just goes with them. It's got a very nifty way where it makes sure it stays with our DNA and, um, and it gets carried along to all those daughter cells. So we measured the actual levels of Epstein-Barr virus DNA in, um, within the blood. In our control population, the people who had higher vitamin D levels had lower levels of this Epstein-Barr virus DNA. And that's what we expect because we know that vitamin D, um, when viruses invade the cell, that people, uh, vitamin D forms this um, antimicrobial thing called cathelicidin and it attacks the virus and kills it. So, so that all makes sense. If you have a higher vitamin D, you have lower levels of this circulating Epstein-Barr virus. But in our cases... If you had just a higher level of Epstein-Barr virus DNA, you didn't have an increased risk of having MS. But in the cases who had both higher vitamin D and higher levels of Epstein-Barr virus DNA, you had a very high risk of having MS. And you go, well, how does that make sense? Because if you have vitamin D, you should have lower viral DNA anyway. And if you have high vitamin D, then you should have a decreased risk of MS. And our interpretation of this is that if you have a high viral load, more viral DNA in the blood, even though you have a high vitamin D, then what's happening is that the T cells that should be controlling, keeping the, the level of that viral DNA in the B cells very low, the T cells are not working properly. And so this is our our new paper that's, that's coming out from the Oz immune study. Um, again, a lot of our stuff is an indication to other researchers to then actually get down the basic science people to actually look at those T cells and uh, interaction with Epstein-Barr virus and so forth. So we sort of highlight these things. If we had... Um, I, what I would like to do is to be able to expand and measure the Epstein-Barr viral load on the rest of our samples so that we had another data set that we could corroborate the findings that we'd found, but also a bigger data set so we can actually look with, with bigger numbers. 
Um, I might leave it there, Jeremy. Okay. That's right.